Praise the Lord, everyone. If you've got your Bible with you, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 3? And uh, we're going to read from verse 13. Uh, we've entitled this little thought, uh, When Jesus Calls. Uh, there's been many books written about the call of God. Um, but this is just a, a little thought. Um, this morning, three different calls. The call to salvation, the call to separation, and the call to service. It says in verse 13 of Mark chapter 3, And he goeth up, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus, he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth on to him whom he would. And they came on to him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. It's verse 13, it says, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth on to him, whom he would. The call to salvation, brothers and sisters. It says, and he calleth on to him whom he would. The first time that we hear God's call in the scriptures, and the first time we hear his call to fallen man, is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9 in the Garden of Eden. It says, And the Lord called unto Adam. Here's God calling unto fallen man. It says, And God, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Ever since then, every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl who has ever came forth to the call of salvation has heard the voice of the Lord calling them. In other words, you cannot get saved until God calls you. Adam was hiding behind a tree when God came and called him and said, Where art thou? And ever from that, every person ever born, if you like, is still hiding behind the tree because of sin. And unless God calls them out, they would never and could never come to him. In other words, God does the calling. We do the responding. You didn't start this. Almighty God himself did. Listen to these few scriptures. and These, these scriptures excite me. They, they bless my soul every time I read them. The first one is to be found in John chapter 15 and verse 16. Listen to these words. He says, and this is, this is the Lord Jesus himself speaking. He says, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen you. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says these words, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Then in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9, and I love this, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 
Then in John chapter 6 and verse 37, it says, Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me. I think that's wonderful. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I believe the call of salvation begins with God himself. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Then in verse 8 it says, For by grace are you saved. The unmerited favor of God. There was nothing that you done to merit this, that you're saved by grace alone. Saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind. And Jesus died for me. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Even the very faith that you have is not of yourself. It says it is a gift of God. And then it goes on to clarify, not of works, lest any man should boast. The greatest gift that anyone can receive is salvation through the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I find tremendous comfort in these scriptures, brothers and sisters, especially when you're going through some stuff, when you're struggling, when the flesh is lusting against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and you're having one of those days, one of those bad days or one of those bad weeks, and let's be honest, one of those bad months, and you wonder what end he is up, and I find great uh, comfort in these scriptures that I didn't start this that I didn't choose God but God has chosen me he says you have not chosen me but I have chosen you it's a great mystery I understand that and in fact churches have been arguing over these scriptures for many years I don't know what there is to argue about. I just believe it and I think it's something wonderful to, to, to understand and to experience that God has chosen me. Someone has wrote, uh, and I thought this was beautiful, it says, when we get to heaven, you'll see the, the, the scripture on top of the pearly gates, whosoever Whosoever may enter herein. Scripture says, For God so loved the world that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So it's for everyone. And then when we go through those pearly gates and we look back, the scripture above the pearly gates will say, Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. It's a great mystery. But I think it's a wonderful truth that I did not choose Almighty God. That this salvation did not begin with me, but that this salvation began with Almighty God. The call to salvation. Number two. The call to separation. The call to separation. Boys and dear, we're separated at the minute, aren't we? We're separated from our families. With this old lockdown. Parents haven't seen their children for a long time. You know, I thank God for the internet where we can FaceTime one another and text one another and, uh, and speak to one another and on and on. But you know, there's, there's people locked up in homes, brothers and sisters, especially the elderly. And uh, they don't even know how to use 
the likes of FaceTime and stuff and uh, it's very difficult for them with families living in other countries and they're worried about their loved ones back here maybe in Ireland and on and on separated from our children I have five children I'm missing them so much and I'm sure you're missing your family too and all my little grandchildren and uh, but I thank I thank the Lord for FaceTime and uh, a couple of times a week uh, my grandson uh, grandchildren they would they would ring and uh, they would FaceTime uh, Jennifer my wife and I and and we would talk and, and it, it does your heart good but boys are dear you, know, you just want to reach through the screen as it, as it were and just give them a big hug I think there's going to be some hugging going on when this is all over and you know the, the day is coming when it is going to go over um, you know I once said this to a, a pastor um, who had went through a lot of stuff we're thinking into the detail of it um, but it was a lot of bad stuff and I remember I says to him, there's only one thing worse um, than what has happened here. And it was terrible what had taken place. I says, there's only one thing worse than what has happened here. And he says, what's that? And I says that we don't learn by what has taken place. So this called the separation, it's a separation on to holiness. And can I say this? I believe separation. When God separates a person, um, it's for preparation. God is preparing that person, preparing possibly a family, preparing possibly a church for something that lies ahead. Um, separation is when God wants to get you alone for himself. Have you ever had this experience before uh, coronavirus hit, hit the world? Um, but have you ever had a time in your life where you felt God separated you, even for a season, onto himself? It's a great privilege when God does that. Now, if I'm honest, it, usually when that happens, you know, it's not like you're spending a fortnight in Tenerife or, or in Spain or, or somewhere. It's, it's, it's different because God separates you. He can separate you from the brethren. He can separate you from your fairy church. He can separate you from your family for, for an amount of time um, for, for the, to educate you and to lead you and to prepare you for what lies ahead. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, we see one of the first times where God is separating someone onto himself. In this case, it is Abraham. And he, he says in Genesis 12 and 1, he says to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. <laughs> Sound familiar? Separate him from his kindred. He says, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. And from thy father's house. Now watch this. On to a land that I will show thee. In other words, I'm separating you. I'm sending you forward. But I'm not telling you where you're going. In other words, I will show you when you get there. Powerful, isn't it? He says, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house onto a land that I will show thee. God separated Abraham and was leading him to a land that he hadn't seen yet. And he had no idea where he was going. With everything that's going on at the minute, brothers and sisters, can I just say this at this point? I believe God is separating a people onto himself. I don't think I have ever seen a time where God has got his people's attention like today. 
My, I haven't got time to go into this. My phone literally hasn't stopped. I was sharing this with different uh, pastors today on the phone. And they're the same. My phone hasn't stopped with people looking to God like never before. And people who have been even gripped by fear. And I'm talking even God's people. And I'm telling them there's nothing to fear but fear itself. People have come to the Lord over the past couple of weeks and I'm delighted to hear that. And I have heard, in fact, people have confided in me how that they have now turned from their wicked ways. These are God's people. And they have confessed openly to me and says, Pastor, I have not been living my life right. I've had alcoholics ring me and text me and saying, God has given me chance after chance after chance. Oh, pastor, will you pray for me? That's just in this past week. I could say more, but I have to be careful because they're going to hear this message and I'm not out to offend anybody. But a lot of God's people at this time, separate, God has separated them. But I have good news for every one of you. So if he has separated you, it's to prepare you for something. He hasn't left you and he hasn't forsaken you. But if you found yourself in this place of separation, why don't you take this time to get close to the Lord? To get into his word and, and ask him to show you things to come. He can do that for you. Hallelujah. It's hard to preach in there. It's hard to preach in their camera, you know. I wish I had a congregation shouting back, Amen. My wee grandson says, he says, Grand, to put your teddy bears, not my teddy bears, his teddy bears. I haven't got any teddy bears. Confession's good for the soul. He says, get all the teddy bears and set, set them all around and preach the teddy bears. Hallelujah. God separated Abraham and was leading him to a land that he hadn't yet seen. But God was leading him every step of the way. In Hebrews 11 and 8, speaking of Abraham, it says, by faith, by faith. This is how Abraham went forward, in faith. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, Hallelujah, here's this call to separation. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. I know a, a very dear friend has went to be with the Lord, Jim McClellan. And uh, it was a missionary in Africa, and I was asked to take his funeral. And this is the very scripture that I used of, of Jim McClellan. And I remember I read, by faith Jim McClellan, when he was called to go, uh, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he went. And it's a tremendous story. I wish I had time to tell you. It's a wonderful testimony. God spoke to him in the midst of a meeting. And at that time he wasn't even saved. And told him to go to Africa. <laughs> and he obeyed. He didn't even know what he was going to Africa for. He bought, he bought a return ticket to Ethiopia. And he took £3,000 worth of American dollars. And he was going to change them into the local, local currency which was burr. And give it out to the poor. He didn't know why God had called him out there. It's a wonderful story. But he went out of bed. God not even really know where he was going. What he was going out for. And he ended up building one of the. Uh, uh, wonderful best works that I have ever seen in my life. The work in Ethiopia. Where they catered hundreds and hundreds of little children. Educating them. Feeding them. Clothing them. The whole community has been enriched by this ministry of this man who obeyed God and went down not knowing where he was going. God still does these things. 
I wonder who is separating even now while I'm speaking onto himself. To educate them and to prepare them for what lies ahead. Do you believe, Pastor, that there's good things lying ahead? Absolutely, with all of my heart. I believe God, you're going to see a move of God like, like never before in this little land of ours. In fact, I have a message that's sitting here. I've entitled it. I was, actually, I was tempted to preach it. I'll maybe preach it next week. And there's the title of it. Be prepared for revival because revival is being prepared for you. Hallelujah. You're mad, Pastor. Will you let me be mad because you need my madness? <laughs> when was the last time you heard of men believing God for anything? In 1 Kings chapter 17, read it when you have time, because time is going here. You, you, you read this, 1 Kings chapter 17, and you're going to read it. Of, of Elijah and God sent him to a place called Cherith and the, and the, and the name Cherith actually means uh, separate or separation God was separating him he told him to go but he was also he separated him to prepare him for what was about to come it's powerful. God still is separating people onto himself. And I believe at this time, the church has been separated. But pastor, all the churches are closed. I know that. But the church has never been more alive. The buildings are closed. <laughs> God's people haven't closed. And if there's any of God's people listening to this and your head's going down, lift the head back up again because God's about to do wonderful things. And I know how, how difficult it is at this time out there. But I have never been so encouraged at the things that I have heard about. Even this morning, I got a text to tell me that they're playing Christian music in the fiery wards to the patients. Unheard of. Nurses and doctors bringing in the Christian music and playing it to those who are in those beds. Many of them dying of coronavirus. And they're trying to reach them with the gospel. Those nurses, they're like angels. Those doctors are like angels to these people. Ministering to them everything they can. But for those who are not going to make it, the doctors and nurses there who, who love the Lord Jesus, who are preaching the gospel like never before. It's time last year that I got the sack for doing it. God is opening doors, brothers and sisters, all over the place. God sent this man to prepare him for what lay ahead. We haven't really got time. But can I say this? At the brute church, which means separation, there wasn't much there. There was a brute with water in it and ravens were commanded to come and feed him every day. Excuse me. Ravens were commanded to come and feed him every day. He had to separate himself to places that didn't have much. Even when he went down to Sarapta, there was a widow woman there who was preparing to cook her final meal for her and her son and then die of starvation. And she had a little cruise of oil and a barrel of meal. Enough in it for one more meal. I think I said this in my last message. And Elijah says, bake me a little cake first. And how we should give to God first. That's what's wrong. God's people don't give to God anymore. And they miss the blessing. God's Many of God's people don't tithe. A tenth. And even if a lot of you are listening to this message now. And you're putting the buckets over the head. And you're looking to see what you're going to have for dinner. 
Why don't you just tune in for a wee second? Yes, tithe. You're robbing God and you're robbing your own family of the blessing. Bring the tithe into the storehouse and prove me by doing it. Prove me here with and see if I don't open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Is your tithe, your tithe or lack of your tithe stopping the blessing that God wants to give to you? I don't know where that came from. It's not in my message. But brothers and sisters, Elijah, he had to separate himself onto a place that didn't have much. And listen, and be completely reliant on God's word. By the way, before God will call anybody to service, he has to separate them. Let me close with point three. The call to service. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. It says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And by the way, Paul and Barnabas had both been separated for quite a time before this took place. And now they were ready for service. It says, and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work we're on to have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they, they sent them away. This is, a way of pro this is a problem that I see in, in many, many churches. People sent before the rally. It says so, first for so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. You have to be sent forth by the Holy Ghost. It says in verse 5, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also joined to their minister. And when they had gone through the Isle of of, of Pathos, they find a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. There's a right few of them still about today. Any amount of them. A false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Alamus the sorcerer, for so is he his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. There's many people would try to stop you getting saved. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. And Holy Ghost filled men and women to reach you. Can I say this? There's many pulpits in Northern Ireland filled with men and they wouldn't have a clue what the born again message is or what the faith message is. Unsaved men in pulpits, blind leaders of the blind. Pastor, you can't be serious. Let me tell this story quickly. I was working in the Shanko Road Mission. I was about maybe three, four years saved at the time. And um, my, one of my jobs was to look after, uh, you know, different people who come into the place. And, and it was run by the Presbyterian Church. Now, if you're a Presbyterian, don't be offended. I'm just telling you the truth here. And I was brought up in the Presbyterian Church. And I can honestly say I never heard the gospel in it. But that's another story. But I was in that Shanka Road mission. I was the coordinator. And this day my job was to look after about 30 uh, Presbyterian ministers. And I went over and sat with a young man who was just about to take his own church on. And I began to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ to him. 
and how he had saved me and how he had changed me and how he had brought me into the Shankle Road Mission and gave me that job and I was just, I was overflowing with what God had done in my life. He got up and he run out. And all the ministers looked at him as he ran out the door. And then they all looked back and they looked at me. And I got up and I remember walking over to my then boss, Eric Lennon. And Eric says, what happened? I says, Eric, I, I was just sitting talking to him about the Lord Jesus, how he had saved me, called me and all the rest of it. And he says, oh, that's what's wrong. And I says, what do you mean? He says, he wouldn't understand that. And I says, what do you mean? He says, son, he's not saved. Well, three or four years saved. I looked at him and I says, but he's a minister. He says, I know, but he's not saved. I says, but he's a minister. He says, I know, but he's not saved. And then I remember what he said. He says, David, there's quite a few of them sitting over there and they're not saved. When God took me to the Shankill Road Mission, he had spoke to me and he told me it was to educate me. That was one of the first things I got educated in. And 30 years later, I'm now telling you about it. Men and pulpits not saved. It went to university and got a degree in theology and was getting put through the training in the Presbyterian Church. And being put into a pulpit. It's the same with the Church of Ireland. Many churches all over the world have men and who are not saved, hirelings. The call to service. Let me tell you. According to Acts 13 and 2, it's the Holy Ghost who separates a man to service. And can I say this? You're not ready for service until the Holy Ghost tells you. I'm saying that with all the love of my heart because I know that there's genuine men and women out there and they want nothing more than to serve God. Jesus says, blessed are, are you, when, you when, when you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And it's a wonderful thing to be hungry for the things of God. And to, to, to desire the office <laughs> of, of, of a shepherd or a pastor or a deacon or whatever to serve God. It's a wonderful thing. And I'm not trying to knock anybody or put anybody down that's doing that. I'm just telling you, you're not qualified to the Holy Ghost tells you you're qualified. Church that I was brought up in, I can remember Pastor McConnell, my, my pastor, teaching us from a, from a very young age. And, and he wasn't trying to knock colleges or, 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 or Christian schools or, or universities or degrees or any of the rest of it. But he says, he says there's, a, there's a school of hard knocks. And he says, have you ever thought about just putting your coat on, getting away into the, uh, into the countryside or down onto the beaches and crying on to God? The school of the Holy Ghost, letting him educate you. All the degrees in the world is not going to cut it. It's the call of God. It's the call to service by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Notice how Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost on first night. When he had come up against this sorcerer. But he being filled with the Holy Ghost set his eyes on him and knew, and knew how to deal with it. It was the Holy Ghost that equipped him for such a time as this. Notice how Saul was filled with the Holy Ghost in first name. Brothers and sisters, I have to close here. 
I'm going over my time as usual, but I believe that the filling and the calling of the Holy Ghost is what qualifies a man and a woman to full-time service. You ready for this? Nothing else. Nothing else. They say, I want to get myself in trouble now. <laughs> Let me read that again to you. I believe the filling and the calling of the Holy Ghost is what qualifies a man and a woman to full-time service. Nothing else does. And I wrote this earlier. You ready? Today, the criteria for ministry is to graduate from a Bible school or to have a basis of knowledge of education. But in the Word of God, in the Bible, the criteria to be in ministry, to be one of the gospel preachers, you needed to be empowered Hear me, you need the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is not an option. The Holy Spirit is a necessity and a command. There's men in the pulpits today they're not anointed. They don't know the Holy Ghost. It saddens my heart. It breaks my heart. Because the people who are listening to them, there's no power in the pulpit. There's no power in the word that they preach. And it was Jesus who said, you shall receive power after, not before. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. You need the power of the Holy Ghost to witness. A factually. Jesus said, don't ever go on, don't ever go out until you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's why he told them in, Acts, in the book of Acts, to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And that 120 in the upper room the likes of Peter who has denied him three times. They're sitting waiting on the promise. But they're of one accord and one mind. That's what Calvary done. It brought the people together. And now they're sitting in the upper room. Hallelujah. And the Holy Ghost is poured out. And watch the next time Peter speaks. Over 3,000 souls give their lives to Christ because he spoke with a boldness that was given him by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, don't ever go until you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be healed, to be delivered, and to be transformed which is all and all our human needs requires a move off the Holy Spirit. I have to close here. Praise the Lord. Do they get a drink? In verse 8, it talks about Alamus the sorcerer. It says he withstood them. Notice how the enemy attacks immediately after the call. But this was to prove to Paul and Barnabas that God had equipped them. I wish I had more time. If you read in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5, it will tell you that 
the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and asked him what he should give to him. And in verse 9, Solomon asks for wisdom and an understanding heart. And uh, verse 16 says, you will read from verse 16 how his wisdom is put to the test in order for him to realize that God had already imparted him. I believe that's why Alamus the sorcerer was there. And how Peter was able to, to deal with it. Or sorry, how Paul was able to deal with it. Being filled with the Holy Ghost, sat his eyes on him. I love this. Listen to what he said. He said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Wouldn't get too many preachers in the pulpits today talking like that. Sure you wouldn't. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right way of the Lord? I'm going to say this. You see the amount of people sitting in pews today. Perverting the ways of the Lord. Oh, I could tell you story after story. People stand and worship them with their hands up. Perverting the ways of God. I have to close here. Get me angry. But it's a righteous anger. I've watched this. My friend, hear me. I've watched this. It breaks my heart to think of ministers and pulpits preaching. It's not even preaching. Bringing the lesson for the week. He appears to Solomon in a dream by night. What do you want? Solomon asks him for wisdom and an understanding heart. And God grants him it. And by the way, his, re his request pleased God that much that he gave him all the things that he didn't ask. But from verse 16, you will find that this uh, wisdom is put to the test. One with two women. And they're both a child and one of, the ch one of the children dies in the night. And, and the woman who owned the, owned the child who died swathed it with a living child. Of course, the, the mother gets up the next morning and she realises the child she's holding is not her child. And they bring the, ch the, the situation to Solomon. And he's just asked God for wisdom, remember? What do you do in a situation? Here's two women, you've never met them. There's a child, there's a living child and a dead child, and they're fighting, arguing. That's my child, that's my child, back and forward. And that wisdom, Solomon says, give me a sword. Cut the child in half. Separate the child. Give them half each. But the mother, she stepped forward and she says, give her the child. There's a wee lesson in there, if I can just throw this in. There's many a woman who have had to give up their child. Don't be too hard on them. Don't be too hard on them. God knows why. They had to do it. That wisdom from above. Give me a sword. Had identified the real mother. Hallelujah. 
Brothers and sisters, as I close, I'm closing for 10 minutes in it. When God calls you to service, he will equip you. And put the equipment <laughs> to the test. Do you hear me? When God calls you, he will equip you. But he'll put that equipment to the test. And by the way, that equipment never fails. It never fails. Note the order of the call. The call to salvation, the call to separation, and the call to service. There are people sitting in churches and they're not saved. Could that be you, my friend? You're listening to this little word. You're going to say this, you may even be serving in the church. Man has maybe promoted you. I remember speaking to a man in Rathcool, so proud. I'm an elder in the church, he says. Hey, wonderful. He says, I'm a treasurer. I said, praise the Lord. I says, how long are you saved? Conversation went downhill after it. And I remember what he said to me, because I was talking about salvation and how the Lord saves and how you know. For I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded. You can know and be persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. And tell them all these things. The Son of God who loved me and gave, him, gave himself for me. I know that my Redeemer liveth. On and on. I'm standing giving him all these scriptures. And he said to me, he says, that's cockiness. He says, that's not. That's faith. That he didn't have. And here's a man serving in the church, not saved. And proud to be serving. Can I be talking to you? You serve in a church, but you know you're not saved. The only person you're deceiving is yourself. Salvation. Then separation. You ready for this? There are people called to service who have never been separated. Who have never been alone with God. And thirdly, I've run out of time. Salvation, then separation, and then service. Can I say this? There are people who have been called by man and not by God. Therefore, they are unqualified and in great danger. Somebody pulled a few strings to get them into ministry. So you can attack me all you want, but I know what I'm talking about. Families with a few pounds. With their car parking spot out the back. And their seat. Cap for them. Do you really think that that's the call of God in their lives? Brothers and sisters. Make sure of your own salvation. Separate yourself at his command. And serve him in the power and the might of the Holy Ghost. May God bless these few thoughts to every one of your hearts. I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Can we pray? Father, I pray that if there's anyone who hears this word who is not saved, that you would save them. That you would draw them, Father. That they would realize that they haven't chosen you, but you have chosen them and brought them under the sound of this word. And I pray, Father, that 
Lord, they would have the courage of their conviction to ask Jesus into their heart. And there are those, Father, and you have separated them. And they feel that they're in a wilderness experience. But, oh God, may they know your presence. May they feel your lovely presence, Father, even, Lord, as they're waiting on you, separated, Father, and waiting to be called into service. Give them patience, Father. Let them occupy until you come, but, Father, I'm asking you that they will not go too soon, that they will wait on thee. And Father, I pray for those who are in service that you will anoint them like never before by the power of the Holy Ghost, that that anointing, Father, will be felt wherever they go, that when they walk into a room, people will perceive that they have been with Jesus. Lord, that their service will be effectual for thee. Thank you, Father, for your word. At this time of uncertainty, we have got a sure word, Father, that we can stand on and rely upon. So I pray, bless thy word now. Unto our hearts and glorify your lovely name. This I ask, giving you thanks. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Stay safe, and the Lord richly bless you. Amen.